Okay. Today I will talk about how if one considers the discrete nature of space-time at Planck scale, one can make sense of the black hole information paradox and hopefully shed light in the fate of information in quantum gravity. So this talk is, will be maybe different of what we've been hearing so far, but it's going to be more on the space-time side and more on the concrete model side, but hopefully this, uh, this will stimulate ideas to see these concrete models of quantum gravity maybe in a different way and in a new light uh, coming from information the theory and so on. Up to all numbers. So the theme of this talk will be that of uh, entropy, entropy arising from special initial conditions, complexity and coarse graining. Since Carlo already explained this uh, uh, wonderfully this last couple of days, I will just consider an example. So if one sets the example of setting on fire a piece of paper, if one considers this piece of paper initially, this is an special initial condition with respect to me as a microscopic observer. <coughs> I can distinguish the molecules of ink in one letter, in the other letter, and the other letter. But once I set on fire this paper, me as a microscopic observer, I lose the ability to track the correlations between all these molecules. And thus, me as a coarse grain observer, I would think that entropy grows. And I think that information is lost because I cannot track all of these uh, correlations. So what I want to argue is that uh, black, hole, black hole formation and black hole evaporation is an example of this. So when one uh, takes into account quantum effects, one can show that black holes emit radiation. Black holes are not really that black because they emit something now, they emit thermal radiation, and that black holes have entropy. Now, in loop quantum, uh, loop quantum gravity, one makes sense of this entropy by counting microscopic degrees of freedom that are compatible with a given uh, macro state. To be more concrete, one considers a, a classical black uh, hole geometry, a black hole with a given mass m, for example, and then one counts all the spin networks, all the quantum geometries that are compatible with this uh, macroscopic uh, black hole. By counting that, one obtains the right formula for the entropy, and so the key insight behind all of this is that each classical black hole geometry, each uh, macrostate, is compatible with a lot of quantum geometry states in whatever the fundamental theory is. So now, if one assumes that this is true in general, and there are good reasons to assume that, not only in loop quantum gravity, but also in another quantum gravity approaches, that is, if one assumes that each macroscopic smooth geometry is highly degenerate in whatever the fundamental theory is, and that smoothness arises from coarse graining of these quantum geometries. So in this view, flat space-time is only a macroscopic uh, concept, but that uh, contains all uh, a myriad of states that differ one of the other by only Planck uh, defects. For example, a Planck mass there, a Planck mass here, and, and so on. And this observation is going to be the key for solving this uh, Hawking's information paradox. So let me motivate really quickly what this uh, paradox uh, is. <coughs> As I said, black holes radiate thermally. So they start, once they form, they start radiating and start losing mass, losing energy, and eventually they evaporate. A uh, not so rigorous way to put the, the paradox, but a really intuitive one is once the black hole starts radiating uh, thermal energy, <coughs> particles are spontaneously created across the horizon. These particles are uh, generically highly entangled. One of the particles escapes to infinity and gets to live on, but the other one falls into the black hole, falls into the singularity. Once the black hole evaporates, all the correlations, all the information in the correlation between these two particles are lost. And then one usually says that uh, information is lost. To put it in another way, 
the information that is available to us after the black hole evaporates is not uh, enough to reconstruct the past history of the spacetime. So now, <clears throat> this is where this uh, quantum degrees of freedom came into play. The idea is that one again starts in a special initial state before the black hole formed. And yes. it's a special state in the sense that correlations between all this uh, microstructure, between all of uh, this quantum geometry are initially not present. Then the state evolves through a high curvature phase that the high curvature phase will act as the fire in the burning paper case. It will act, will act by uh, igniting correlation with this quantum degrees of freedom, with this uh, quantum microstructure. And then after evaporation, one has an old spacetime in the sense that one has a spacetime with correlations between these degenerate uh, microstates. So if one were to consider both the correlation in these uh, quantum microstates and the Hawking radiation, one has a pure state. So one can make sense again uh, of a unitary evolution between an initial and a final state. Another way to see this is the following. Let's go back to the Hawking pair. One of the pair goes to infinity. The other one falls into the high curvature region. This high curvature again acts like, uh, acts like a fire and ignites this correlation. The Hawking quanta transfer the correlation to this quantum microstructure. And then after the black hole evaporates, if one considers the whole information in both the correlations of the microstructure and the Hawking quanta that was radiating to infinity, one has uh, again a pure state. But for observers, for coarse grain observers that are insensitive to this, uh, to this microstate and they only see flat spacetime, all this information is going to be lost the same way that information to me was lost once I set the, the paper on fire and I wasn't able to, to follow all the correlations. <clears throat> so now, and I think that's the, the new, new thing, is that one can uh, make precise all of this expectation and one can realize the mo this model in an actual quantum, full quantum gravitational context. Now, this context is not going to be <laughs> black holes, but it's going to be quantum cosmology for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that calculations are way easier, as always. The other reason is that these models are close to what really happens in the interiors of black holes. They are close to models that uh, model the interior of black holes. And the third and more important reason is that all of the, the expectation and all of the ingredients that we need in the black hole case are also in this case we're going to have special initial conditions where this uh, microstructure is initially uncorrelated from low energy degrees of freedom. We're going to have a high curvature phase that ignites correlations. And we're going to have a notion of coarse grain observers. Now, <coughs> loop quantum cosmology is a, a symmetry reduced model, meaning that one throws out all degrees of freedom and only keeps one that is going to describe the large uh, structure of space-time. It's going to describe the scale factor of the of space-time. One then does a uh, non-standard quantization, meaning a quantization that is non-equivalent to a standard Schrodinger one. And one does this because this non-standard quantization is going to, to take into account the background independence spirit of general relativity. By doing these non-standard quantizations, at the end one gets a lattice-like uh, quantization in where the three volume of, uh, of space-time at a given time is going to be quantized. There are, of course, a lot of models that differ a little bit between themselves, but generically one has initially a semi-classical universe that undergoes collapse, then instead of having a big bang singularity, one has a bounce, and then the universe bounces back and starts expanding again. 
<coughs> so I just want to now finish the talk uh, telling you about this concrete model. Now, as I said, one uses a non-standard quantization of the commutation, the canonical commutation relations. So one considers a Hilbert space that is non-separable. One can think roughly of this Hilbert space as a space containing functions that have support on every possible lattice in one dimension. A way to write this concretely is to consider a regular lattice with, for example, lattice spacing 4K. One considers the functions with, su with support on it. And then one considers all the lat lattices that go, that are of this uh, form, 4KN <coughs> plus epsilon, where the epsilon sweeps the whole real line. So then one considers a discrete sum, uh, sum over this uh, epsilon that goes from zero to the lattice spacing in such a way to consider every possible lattice of one dimension. So as I said before, this is a non-standard quantization. And in this Hilbert space, the momentum P is not defined on this Hilbert space. Here, the relevant variables are going to be the momentum and the conjugated uh, variable that is the volume of the, the three volume of a slice of space time at the fixed time. <coughs> so now, the momentum here is not going to be defined on this uh, weird Hilbert space, but only finite translations are defined. So how this translation acts on a arbitrary state in this uh, Hilbert space? States in this Hilbert space, and in general in quantum gravity, they carry a label uh, from the lattice, meaning <coughs> this label here is telling me that this function has support only on this lattice that can be regular or it can be a superposition of these uh, lattices, so can be non-regular too. So <coughs> what final translation do, they take the function, they take the lattice and they shift them by a finite amount. So now one, comp one can compute the eigenvectors of these shift operators and one can see that they are simply plane waves with support on regular lattices. But one can see that these eigenvectors are infinitely degenerate because the eigenvalues do not depend on this epsilon. One can take two different uh, lattices with regular lattices with different epsilons. One can apply this shift operator and we will see that the eigenvalue do not, does not depend on this epsilon. And this is going to be important for what follows. Are you going to restrict to super selection sector or not? Uh, at some point, yeah, but this, that's not important. And this is the case. If one restricts to only one super selection sector, one cannot make sense of these uh, correlations. These epsilons are going to be the high energy, the Planckian degrees of freedom. Then, but after we can discuss why we or if we can consider different super selection sectors, but that's, I'm going to argue in a... <coughs> okay. So now, doing some choices along the way, and maybe the people in LQC will argue with me, but doing some, doing some choices along the way, one can show that the Hamiltonian describing the evolution of a homogeneous chunk of space-time is given simply by the Hamiltonian of a free particle, <coughs> meaning a Hamiltonian that depends on P square. As I said before, this P is not defined on this weird Hilbert space, so one needs to approximate this Hamiltonian with these uh, shift operators that are the things that are defined in this Hilbert space. So one introduces uh, some cutoff, some Planckian cutoff, and then one uh, approximates this Hamiltonian by, the, by this sign square, usually. Now, one thing that one can show is that the Hamiltonian in this uh, cosmological model is exactly the cosmological constant. <coughs> so now, 
we again look for the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the cosmological constant. And one can show again that they are infinitely degenerate because they don't depend, they do not depend on this uh, epsilon parameter. So just to be concrete, these eigenstates of the cosmological constant are infinitely degenerate and de they do not depend on the epsilon parameter. So now if one were to do a meso mesoscopic scale quantization, meaning if one were to do a traditional Schrodinger quantization, and this is mesoscopic in the sense that it doesn't capture the deep uh, Planck scale structure, the deep UV structure, if one were to do this type of quantization, <coughs> one would see that the eigenstate of the cosmological constant of the energy are now twofold degenerate. Given uh, a cosmological constant, one can only see if the universe is expanding or if the universe is contracting. <coughs> so our coarse grain observers are going to be those that are completely insensitive to this epsilon, different epsilon lattice, and they only know whether the universe is expanding or contracting. So, so far, uh, as you said, there is an uh, invariance here. All the epsilon sectors have the same dynamics. <coughs> so you take an epsilon sector, you study the dynamics, the dynamics preserve that lattice, and for all the lattice, the dynamics are going to be exactly the same. But now, when you introduce matter, matter carry an explicit dependence on the lattice sites, explicit dependence on, the, on X. And this is going to break this invariance between different epsilon sectors. So <coughs> now when one considers the model containing both this uh, cosmological constant and matter, one can solve the problem, one can solve the, the dynamics of this, uh, of this model. And of course, one would see that this is a unitary evolution because one has a Hamiltonian and there is no information loss or anything. But now when one considers the information that is relevant for low energy observers that are insensitive to this uh, epsilon parameter, and for doing such calculation, one has to restrict to a finite number of uh, epsilon sectors. So if one traces out all the information encoded in these epsilon sectors, one can see that even if one starts from uh, pure states, going through a high curvature phase will bring you into a mixed state in the same way that burning a paper did. With this, what I want to say, <coughs> the universe, as in, in most uh, quantum cosmology models, starts in a, <coughs> in a semi-classical uh, state, a big universe, a semi-classical big universe. This universe has no correlation between all of these different epsilon states. This universe collapses up until the Planck scale, the high curvature phase. This here is the entropy, this is the volume. The <coughs> universe starts collapsing up until it reaches the Planck scale where correlations with these epsilon sectors, with these uh, Planckian degrees of freedom start occurring. And thus, for course grain observers, entropy will jump during the high curvature phase. And then the universe starts expanding again and one gets again <coughs> a semi-classical universe but now one can think that one has an old universe in the sense that correlations that weren't there before are established during a high curvature phase. <coughs> so just to finish, I think I'm on time, right? Uh, information in this view, we advocate that information is not lost, but is degraded in black hole evaporation. It's degraded into a myriad of correlation with these Planckian degrees of freedom in the same sense that when you burn a paper, information is degraded into correlation between molecules. <coughs> when degrees of freedom that are associated with this discrete quantum nature of space-time and disregarded, one can make sense of pure state evolving into a mixed states in a low energy description. More importantly, this idea can be realized 
in a concrete, fully quantum gravitational context. And this is hopefully what it remains of this talk. The key part, the key message of this talk is the consideration of this discrete nature of space-time at Planck scale is crucial to understand the fate of information in quantum gravity. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to um, maybe propose something controversial on the, on the last point. Okay. I would uh, contend that uh, discreteness of space time is not uh, essential <laughs> okay. to the resolution. <laughs> it is the indefinite uh, causal structure. Okay. We'll see that tomorrow in the report. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> not sure, but uh, I just uh, want to <laughs> I mean, want to pose this idea, put it, put it, put it there, and. Uh, I think if you make such a big grand statement, <laughs> yeah. you elaborate on it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, this uh, statement, so uh, do you mean it in general, that like within any uh, approach to quantum gravity, discreteness is a... Is, uh, is, uh, but discreteness can be a word term, right? Sorry? So what discreteness means in every approach to quantum gravity, yeah, but it can be a broad term. So would you contend that uh, any continuous theory to quantum <coughs> gravity would not resolve the problem. Yeah. Then I would uh, I would pr present to you, either <laughs> informally or formally tomorrow, okay. a continuous model that resolves singularity and possibly resolves the uh, information loss problem. Okay. Okay. Then tomorrow <laughs> we <laughs> we are yeah. Another question. Uh, can we go back to the slides with the jars? Uh, okay. Uh, there was a notion of uh, a typical uh, state like if you were going to draw a state. Why one can do something as the page? Uh, okay, but here remember that one only well always have to start with a pretty special state that exactly, is. That's my point, yeah, yeah. But that's that's the the key of the information paradox, right? Because if you start on a typical state, you start with something that already has saturated all the correlations. So you already started with high entropy, and there is nowhere to go. So there, there is no paradox at all. You don't have access to information whatsoever from the start. So you need a state that is far from typicality to have, I mean, and this is what brings you the arrow of time in general. You need to start with a state that is far from typicality that is really special but to observe that. I think the question is more uh, around the, the, this idea of arrow of time. And so you're basically you're putting the arrow of time in the fact that you've got special time, time. Yeah. Okay, let's bring the speaker again.